Hello, and thank you to everyone who has taken the time to join us today as we continue our 2023 webinar series. My name is Cameron McElhenney, and I serve as the Executive Director of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. NACOL is an organization that works to create a community of support for independent civilian oversight entities that seek to make their local law enforcement agencies, jails, and prisons more transparent, accountable, and responsive to the communities they serve. One piece of that effort is our webinar series where, for the last eight years, we have worked to bring you information on effective practices in civilian oversight, innovations in the field, and important work being done in regards to criminal justice reform. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics regarding today's session. With so many of you in attendance, everyone has entered in listen-only mode. However, once today's presentation begins, you can access the area to type in your questions by simply clicking on the Q&A icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You will also have the ability to vote on questions as they are posed by your fellow attendees to move them up in the queue. This will help us to address the most pressing questions in the short time we have together today. I also wanna remind you that today's session is being recorded and will be available to you through the Attendee Hub, the same platform you have just signed into to access today's live session. Your same login information will allow you to watch or rewatch the session shortly after we conclude and therefore please save the link uh, to use in the future. You can also use the Attendee Hub to add future sessions to your schedule. We do have two more sessions left this year and we hope that you will be able to join us for those as well. With the details out of the way, I would like to move our attention to today's session. I'm very excited to welcome Casey Yunko the oversight to the oversight community. Casey is a certified forensic video technician who joined the Axon team with 20 years of experience in video and multimedia. He spent six years as a criminalist specializing in forensic video examination at the Denver Police Department Crime Laboratory, where he performed, performed well over 1,300 video evidence extractions and examinations for investigations ranging from simple criminal mischief and auto theft to homicide, robbery, and all other major crimes investigations. And with that, I'll turn things over to you, Casey. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cameron. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today. Um, I had the uh, privilege of uh, meeting Mr. Wetcher here um, uh, through another presentation last month and was really excited to receive the uh, uh, invitation to present to you all today. So I know that we have um, a limited amount of time and a lot of uh, information to cover. Um, so with that, I'm going to get my presentation up and going. Uh, a little housekeeping on my end. I'm working with three different models monitors to administer this presentation today, so I'm not as ADD as I may uh, appear on camera. Um, so I'm going to get my screens organized here. I will get my presentation up, and uh, I believe we are ready to go. So again, my name is Casey Yonko. I am a LEBA certified forensic video technician. Um, uh, during my time at the Denver Police Department, again, I worked on, you know, well over 1300 cases um, and uh, a lot of experience, a lot of training uh, throughout my career. And uh, today I'm hoping to uh, get through kind of a brief introduction on uh, digital uh, video evidence, primarily focusing on collecting and safeguarding uh, our video evidence, identifying digital video limitations, and then covering misconceptions of digital video uh, evidence. Now, a lot of the topics that we're covering today, I could probably spend my entire time talking about. Um, so we're going to try and keep it pretty high level. Um, I, you know, I, I hope to achieve that after we're done with this, that maybe there's some topics that you're already familiar with. Um, maybe some of you might pick up something new. And if anything, I hope to inspire um, the attendees today, you know, to, to get out, do the research, um, learn some things, you know, maybe get some certification, do some extracurricular training. Um, this the skill set and these topics that we're covering are not simply for law enforcement or video experts like myself. With a little time and, and a little research, you know, anybody can get out and, and look at this type of evidence and know the things that they're supposed to be looking for. And again, how to safeguard this, uh, this type of work and this type of digital uh, evidence. So um, with that being said, we're going to dive right in. Now, um, 
In regards to digital video evidence, uh, recently um, Axon has performed a number of uh, different surveys through our users of Axon uh, Investigate, formerly known as Input Ace. Um, we found that 80% of all criminal investigations nowadays involve digital video evidence of some source. On average, we find uh, video coming from three different sources. So again, if you think of 80% of all in investigations and video from three different sources, that is a great amount of evidence out there in most, most investigations. And we see that this video is coming uh, from most commonly CCTV systems, but we're starting to see a lot more coming from cell phones, obviously from body-worn cameras like the Axon body-worn cameras, in-car cameras, home security systems. Um, I read an article just last year that speculated 46% of all doorbells in the United States now record video. So again, there is a lot of information out there from a digital video standpoint on just about every investigation down the spectrum of criminal investigation. Now, um, where we're going to start today is we're going to start with that collecting and safeguarding your video evidence. Throughout my, uh, my training and my certification, um, a, a very intelligent individual by the name of Grant Fredericks, who um, you know is, has kind of led the path in forensic video examination. He trains at the FBI, um, just a wealth of knowledge, you know, coined this phrase of every download is a research project. Um, and this uh, is, is, is very true to just about anything that I and my colleagues have ever worked on. Um, and any type of investigation dealing with digital video evidence should be handled as such, um, especially when it comes down to uh, you know, the places that we collect this type of video. So the first thing I want to go over is just talk about the different types of systems that we get this video uh, from starting with these CCTV systems. Now, what you're seeing on your screen here is, is, is a very standard and basic breakdown of a digital video recording system or a DVR, as I'll refer to it from this point forward. So most of your systems are these simple little black boxes. They're often found in the most inconvenient places when you're trying to collect video from there, uh, you know, up in a stuffy attic or in a garage or maybe right above the pizza oven at the pizza shop. Um, uh, it's very hot and maybe above the, the, the fryer. I've seen them in those places as, as well, but they're a very simplistic machine, um, even though, uh, you know, what they're doing seems complex uh, on the surface. But you have a black box, you have a place to plug in a mouse. Um, you can see here, I'll bring up my uh, laser pointer here, a place to plug in your analog cameras, um, HDMI, you know, hookups for monitors, etc. Some have the ability to put a... Uh, a network cable in if you can connect to the internet, um, et cetera, and, and, you know, a place to plug in a USB to download your video and collect your evidence. And then some, some have on and off switches. So again, really simplistic. And it gets even more simple when we get into the inside of these systems, because all that really uh, uh, these systems are comprised of is a, a motherboard, which comes loaded with the firmware um, in order to operate the system. So it's not an operating system. It's not like Windows or or, or, or Mac OS or anything of that nature that comes loaded on these systems. It's very simplistic. It's designed to do just the functionality um, that the engineers intend for these systems um, to do. Got some cables that run some data back and forth from the, uh, the motherboard into the hard drive. And then of course you have your hard drive. Now, although there are thousands of different DVR manufacturers and devices, generally these all look the same when you get inside. Um, the hard drive fills up with data once it's turned on and starts recording, and uh, it works in a fashion of first in, first out. So it will record and retain video up until that hard drive is full, and then it will start overwriting the oldest video or the oldest data that is uh, saved on that system. Now, retention time on these systems is determined by a number of things. First off, the number of cameras that a system can can uh, can take um, that can be connected into the system. Um, the video quality settings um, can determine the file size. Uh, you know, obviously, if we're dealing with high definition video as opposed to very low quality, low definition video, the file sizes are going to differ. High definition are going to make larger files, low definition are going to make smaller files. 
And then uh, the recording settings on the system itself. So oftentimes these systems give the user the ability to either set the recording to record 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or it could be based on what is uh, considered an event recording. So the uh, you know motion sensors on a camera can send a signal back, signal back to the system and say, I've, I've detected motion. I want you to start retaining the video that I'm sending you right now. So the reason I bring this up is these are some of the limitations and challenges that, that uh, can exist when dealing with digital video evidence, right? Um, sometimes the pre-roll and the post-roll, how much time is recorded uh, or stored uh, before a motion event is triggered and after a motion event is triggered. Sometimes you may be dealing with evidence where um, you have an empty parking lot and then all of a sudden here's you know somebody of interest in the middle of the parking lot. You say, wait a minute, where did this guy I, you know, how did he appear out of nowhere? It's it's due to the event recording settings on the system itself. And then lastly, you can set a schedule. So sometimes um, I've seen this very common in liquor stores where they will have their schedule set that the system will record, um, you know, continuously during business hours when when you know everyone's there and working, etc. And then after the uh, establishment is closed, it then changes to a motion capture setting. So again, all of this kind of comes into play um, as to how much uh, information can be stored on the uh, hard drive and how long it can be uh, saved on there before it is overwritten. Unfortunately, uh, throughout my experience, I've, I've come across a number of these systems where the user or the owner was told by the security system that installed them that, oh yeah, the system can hold video for up to three months. It absolutely could hold video up to three months if it has the lowest settings possible. It's bad, bad quality video and uh, it's set to event, you know, all of those things. So unfortunately, you come in for, you know, hey, I need to collect some video off your system. Can I see it? Somebody expects it to be there. And unfortunately, it's overwritten, uh, you know, because they were provided bad information from the, uh, you know, the installer. So just a couple things to take in mind on your end when dealing with this type of evidence, you know, explanations as to why maybe uh, uh, some evidence uh, is missing or uh, is not accounted for. Now, um, getting back into these particular uh, particular systems, um, there are NVR, which are network video recorders, much like the system that we just saw. You can see here in the back, we have the ability to uh, plug in um, an array of IP cameras. So we kind of get out of that analog uh, video signal into uh, more of these networked systems. Um, a lot of times we see, see these systems, they can take a lot more cameras than uh, you know some of your more common uh, analog systems, but pretty much the same uh, in the back. Now, there are hybrid systems where you may see a mix of analog as well as digital ports in the back of these systems um, to, uh, uh, you know, mix and match with the certain cameras that are out there. But I will tell you that through my experience, most of the systems you're going to deal with, um, they do have analog cameras that the system is then converting into a digital signal um, and then storing that on the, uh, the hard drive. Now, uh, server-based systems are starting to become more and more popular. Um, systems like Genetech, uh, we see uh, Avigilon is a big brand that is blowing up worldwide right now, and they cause a lot of problems with us at uh, Axon Investigate because of the true proprietary nature of their uh, their files. Sometimes a little bit harder for us to crack that code and get those videos to play in our uh, in our our, our products, but um, made uh, some really positive uh, you know steps forward in the last couple months on that. But um, ultimately, what you will be seeing with this type of server-based system, you will see this big brick maybe in a server room, um, you know, up uh, in the basement or on the top floor of, you know, big high-rise buildings, um, et cetera. Again, they can take a mix of analog and digital cameras. Um, they can take a high camera volume. So I've seen these here in Denver um, covering a lot of, uh, uh, you know, again, bigger spaces, bigger buildings, 
you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 cameras that can be plugged into these systems simply because of the expansive storage. You can see here every single one of these little slots is a hard drive uh, in which that can store that information. So um, these are all, always great to come across because, again, you'll get a high number of cameras recording at a very high quality and a very long retention rate as far as how back that uh, that archive goes. Now, the caveat with these is the operating system is usually pretty complex. Now, these do have operating systems. You can see here they're kind of computer based. So uh, the, you know, the RMS, the, the software that controls, you, know, you can see that in this uh, uh, little image here. Um, they can be a little more complex as far as the buttons go, navigating your way through different cameras, timelines, exporting video can be a little a little harder to figure out if you're not familiar uh, with that type of system. So, um, you know, kind of goes without saying the, the 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 more simplistic the system is, the more simple it is to navigate your way through it and get what you need. Um, the more complex the system is, it may take a little bit longer. But this is where again that research project concept comes into play. It's always good if you need to go and collect video or you've been given video and you have the information as to the system that it came off of, you're able to do a little research on the internet, maybe find a user manual, you know, find some of those specs um, in which that video was, uh, you know, recorded and encoded and uh, can help you understand, uh, you know, what you have in front of you and what you are, uh, what you're working with. Now, getting into more of these uh, service providers, so to speak, so like Ring, Doorbell, Nest, um, these are service provided uh, videos uploaded to the cloud. It usually uh, relies on your Wi-Fi or not yours, but the user's Wi-Fi, internet connections. Um, there isn't necessarily a device on scene that records and stores that video. Again, it's going through the Wi-Fi, it's going up into the cloud, and um, you know that type of information can be accessed through an app on somebody's phone or maybe a web portal that they log into um, to gain that information. Um, we're starting to see more and more wireless systems. Uh, they're not the greatest systems in my in my personal opinion. Um, obviously, wireless, you know, transferring that data through the air, um, like radio waves, it's not the most reliable. Um, I haven't seen many of these personally, but I know that they're starting to become more affordable and more accessible to uh, kind of the more um, consumer base out there than than a prosumer base. And then lastly, we have up here in this camera, this some of the cameras, uh, I personally have these in my house pretty much to keep my eye on my four year old from time to time. Um, these are self contained cameras, they have, you know, a little micro SD card much like you would have put into an old digital camera that just record video stores it for a couple of days, but um, oftentimes used maybe for, you know, live live playback on a phone, um, et cetera. But again, nanny cams, those types of things, uh, we're starting to see more and more of those uh, types of systems. Now, getting into the user interface, I had mentioned, you know, these, these uh, DVRs don't necessarily have operating systems, so they don't look like Windows, they don't function the way like your computer, or your laptops were, they might be pretty unique or proprietary to that, that system itself. Um, a lot of times through my experiences, you know, working with law enforcement, a lot of times they'll stop and say, wow, this looks too complex, I don't want to mess up the system. You don't have to worry about that. We'll, we'll we'll talk about why. So, getting into these systems to review video for playback, um, you normally see you know some type of screen as such where you can bring up a number of different cameras. Um, you can change how many uh, how many cameras are visible at any given time. Um, you will be presented with a timeline. Um, this one here in my example, it appears to be in military time, which is pretty common. Um, as far as, you know, midnight to midnight uh, on any given day um, to scrub through and uh, look at this video. Um, this timeline is often broken down into what some might refer to as tracks. So you might have camera one here on top, camera two, three in the middle, and camera four in the bottom, just depending on how many cameras you're viewing at any given time. Now, to get uh, video playback, um, you will be looking for most commonly some type of calendar. 
within that user interface. Now, these calendars will tell you when uh, video is available and what's stored on that system. This is a very important uh, thing to annotate um, when you're looking at these specific systems. So you can see here um, in these two examples, uh, we have you know a little bit of a different shade of blue on these days and the rest uh, seem kind of blank. That would indicate to me that this system only has video from September 7th through September 10th. Um, so again, important things to look at as you're doing an examination of a system, as you're doing that research project, making note, okay, this system only has this video for four days that could be important, you know, to the work that you're doing, to the research that you're doing, to figure out why there may or may not be video in what you're working on. Same thing here at the difference between these blue, blue squares and these purple squares. If I was doing an assessment on this system, I would say, oh, the the events on this, uh, uh, the calendar on the system is set to record video Monday through Friday, but not record video on the weekends. Why? Totally up to the user, but that's what I would uh, gather from this uh, particular uh, system. So getting into the settings of these systems, this is where a lot of people get scared because they're worried that they're going to they're going to change something or oh, I'm going to, you know, accidentally switch this into Portuguese and then I'm not going to be able to get it back or I change the time or anything of that nature. It's not to worry. You, it's okay to click through these settings as long as you simply avoid clicking any button that says save or apply. You can click through anything as long as you're not hitting save or apply. Even if you accidentally change something, it's not going to save in the system. It's not going to change anything. So again, I like to tell people, don't be scared. It's not as complicated as, as it may seem on the surface. But Getting into the settings, you can learn a lot of helpful information on these systems as to what the date and time is set to, what your recording uh, settings are put at, how many cameras there are, what the quality is set to. Um, again, just a lot of helpful information um, that can help you better understand why your video looks the way it is or why it is the way it is. Um, again, uh, just helpful information to know. And we'll talk about that um, here in a little bit as far as uh, the type of information you should be collecting if you are collecting this uh, this type of evidence. But again, don't worry. Um, again, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. They're all a little bit different from each other. We have found that these manufacturers kind of steal and borrow their, uh, their engineering from each other to save money, especially a lot of the overseas companies. So you may see a number of systems with different uh, uh, different brand names on them, but you dive in and you start looking at their menus and they're all the same. They may just change a logo here and there, change a, uh, some wording on some of their settings, but most of them are are very similar. So again, as long as you're avoiding that save or that apply button, you know, you can get in, you can dive in and, uh, you know, start learning as much as you can from these systems. So this gets me into documentation. Um, there's a lot of important information that you should be documenting if you are responsible for collecting this information from a DVR system. So the first thing you want to annotate is you want to mark down what the make and model of the system is. Now, it will tell you it may not always be uh, available as there is a lot of generic uh, systems out there. I know that my time at the Denver Police Department Crime Lab, we kept an expansive database of all of the different brands and models that we worked with. And the number of one brand and model that we worked with here in the city and county of Denver was a black box generic system that didn't have a, a manufacturer name on it. So um, they're out there, they're cheap, they're very uh, common for people to, you know, I got to put some cameras into my store or onto my garage. I'm just going to go and buy the cheapest thing I can find on the internet. And uh, there you have it. So if it's uh, at all possible, uh, document that information. If you need a particular username and password to get into that system, um, it's good to document that uh, as well, just in case if it ever comes up in court or it's asked, you have that information. Um, obviously, if the owner of that system doesn't want to share, fair enough. Um, you know, we don't want to get into those arguments, but um, you may need to go back and get more information later on uh, throughout your examination or, you know, your uh, your research. Um, just good to annotate that when possible. Serial number, if that's available, there's usually a sticker on the bottom of these DVRs or maybe in the back of some of those server-based systems. Um, always good to have that just in case if you need to further that, uh, that research project, get onto the internet, find a user manual that might tell you here, here's how you execute export video from this uh, the system if it's not uh, if you're not able to figure that out 
um, uh, annotate number of cameras um, that it is capable of taking, as well as the number of cameras that are collected. It is often uh, uh, comes into question uh, in the courtroom. Okay, well, you know, you collected two videos uh, from this system, but your notes say it, you know, it takes uh, six six cameras, where are the other four cameras that are missing? It's good to have that documented. Or if it's coming into question on a video that you received that you're, you know, doing your examination on, it might be, in, you know, of, of your interest to ask those questions. Well, I see that, you know, I was provided with cameras one and four, where are cameras two and three, right? So somebody should have uh, that uh, documented um, in their uh, in their extractions. Um, camera type is uh, important, analog or digital. That may, uh, you know, be some kind of you know precursor information as to the quality of the video that you're dealing with. Um, system date and time at extraction. This is incredibly important as well as your current date and time. Most common. Uh, CCTV or digital video evidence uh, aspect that comes up in the question in the court is the offset of the date and time. I would say throughout my experience, probably 99% of the video that I collected on uh, investigations, the date and time was incorrect on that video. That usually comes from systems tend to drift um, some systems are actually unboxed and just turned on, and then all of that uh, that owner's information, all this video was apparently recorded in the 50s because they just simply didn't set the date and time information on there. Um, you know, blackouts, anything uh, you know can can actually change that date and time. Um, our good old friend uh, daylight savings is a giant headache for uh, for, for digital video for a number of different reasons. Hopefully, that'll be going away soon. But um, again. When you are standing at that system or when someone is standing at that system, they should be documenting the exact date and time that's being displayed by that system at that very second, as well as what the current date and time is, whether they're referencing server time over an app on their phone or just simply looking at the date and time on your cell phone is pretty current. Um, so, so someone can actually calculate what that date and time offset is. Um, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where, well, wait a minute, this was supposed to take place on Monday, but the video says it's Saturday. Why is that? And nobody has accounted for that information, right? We want an a fair and accurate representation of actual date and time of the time that video was recorded. Um, you may want to document the earliest record date. Um, I showed you on that calendar, identifying those different squares that can be helpful to understand why video, why you may not have video um, in a particular uh, moment, or if you need to go back back and, and collect more video um, from that particular system. Ah, oh, man, I need to go back and get more video, but it looks like here in my notes that it only retains, you know, for three days, I've got six hours to get back and get some video off that system. So again, just important to uh, document that in, 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 any, in any case. Um, obviously, make note of your uh, record resolution and quality. I talked about going through those settings and those, those uh, uh, menus there to get that um, record frame rate can be really important as far as how many pictures per second that system uh, is recording at any given time. This can definitely be um, a, a precursor as to why video looks the way it is. I hope that we can get to uh, discussing that um, here momentarily. Um, again, that continuous event schedule recording, whether it's recording 24 hours, whether it's set to motion capture, is there a network cable connected to it? Um, that can come into play as far as, you know, maybe it's deleted uh, on the system itself, but if there's a network connected, maybe it was recording to the cloud somewhere as well, or maybe somebody got in um, video, you know, through their cell phone and changed the settings of the system, you know, could be nothing, but it's just worth uh, annotating um, if you can. Now, retrieval options are important to a document. We'll get into that here in a second as well. Um, as far as did you get video from a USB? Did you have to network into the system? Did you download it from the cloud? Um, make note of what you what you needed to do. And then as well as the option that you use. Some of these systems um, can offer anywhere from two to four different uh, ways to get video off that system. So just make sure that you note um, you know, it could take a USB and that's how I exported the video. 
Um, and then the formats. The formats are very important. Can I export this video in a proprietary format, whether being uh, you know a, a format that's native to that system? I mentioned the Avigilon systems earlier. They they uh, have a format uh, that goes under the extension of a .ave file. Those .ave files can only be opened uh, using the Avigilon uh, proprietary players. So we always want to make sure that we're extracting video in its proprietary form. We'll talk about that here in a second as well. Um, but just make note, I can you know, export video off the system in a proprietary format as well as something more standard with an AVI or an MP4 or something of that nature. But it's good to have that information um, or ask for that information um, if you are provided video from a, another source. So retrieval options, I mentioned USB, that's most common. Most of these systems have a USB, you plug in your thumb drive, you go through the export process. Some older systems still have CD and DVD drives. I think it's kind of crazy that our technology is getting rid of those. I'm not comfortable with those going away just yet, but uh, some of these systems still have the ability to burn a CD or burn a DVD, especially those server-based systems that will function off a computer tower um, or a big server rack. Um, as I had mentioned, SD and compact flash cards, a lot of those nanny cams and uh, self-contained cameras have that ability. Um, some have external hard drives that you can plug in as well as the hard drive that's inside there. Um, Network extractions, as I had mentioned, you can uh, connect your computer or your laptop directly to a system, use the interface and download your video, download your evidence from the system directly onto your laptop. Um, I wish I could go into how that process works, but again, do some research. There's plenty of paperwork um, out there uh, that uh, tells you how to do those processes. And then um, Axon Community Link. If you happen to be a Axon uh, Evidence.com user, you can send a community link, which sends an email to an individual or to a uh, uh, you know business or what have you that says, "Hey, I need you to upload your video." They can do that on your own, and then you have that uh, you have that video you know from the luxury of your desk. <laughs> you don't even have to put boots on the ground. Now, email. Um, we see this often with people that use uh, cell phones to uh, access their systems um, to say, okay, email me this video, beware, because these videos can be and most likely often are more compressed and broken down than the original video itself. So I, I tend to avoid email at all costs, unless it's the, you know, the last case scenario there to get video from, uh, you know, from an individual. So again, be very weary about emailing video back and forth because there's a lot of uh, limitations there. Drive cloning, if you've heard of DVR Examiner, I won't go into this much, but it's a specified tool that can actually make a copy or a clone of the hard drive inside the system itself. This is often used if a system is not functioning or it sees an investigation and nobody knows what the username and password is. Again, there's uh, options out there available. Um, and then seizure. Uh, obviously, you know, if somebody, this probably doesn't apply to this group, but more in law enforcement, if you can't get into it, you're just going to have to take it and put it in the property and uh, see if somebody can get into it at a later time. And then last case scenario, cell phone recording. This is the least effective, and we'll kind of talk about this um, here in a second with another question that was uh, preceding this presentation. But um, retrieval best practices, uh, standard operating uh, procedures. So we're going to talk about that here in a second as well. Um, it's good to have a standard operating procedure. It's good to have guidelines that protect you, especially when it comes to testifying in court. If you are responsible for collecting this video, I followed these procedures that are based on these documents or these best practices that are out there. It's just good to make sure that anybody in your agency or in your group is following the same steps. Police agencies, crime labs like the one I worked in definitely have to have those. So if it ever comes into question, you should be able to request, may I see your standard operating procedures? So then when we get to court, we know if this individual followed everything to the letter and did the work the way they were supposed to do it. All right, obviously document things uh, before you start exporting uh, your video. We always talked about, if you're ever worried about somebody getting into a system and deleting video, again, unplug that cable if necessary. Bring a variety of USB drives. You can see here, um, some of these systems will only recognize USB 2.0, some only recognize USB 3.0, have a number of different uh, uh, 
uh, drives with you just in case if you run into that uh, uh, information or uh, those setbacks. Always export the native proprietary format or both. Again, the native and proprietary version of that video is going to be of the highest quality and the most uncompressed version of that. Again, this is something I could probably talk about for two hours, um, and you will talk about that if you seek further uh, certification and uh, education in digital video evidence. Always, 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 always get that native or proprietary format because, again, it is the best version of that. If somebody presents you with something that's an AVI and MP4, always question, is this proprietary? Is this native? Because you may not be given the best version of that video. Always verify your extraction before you leave. So bring your laptop, plug your thumb drive in real quick, make sure that you actually got the video that you asked the system to give you. And then provide uh, hash your, uh, your, your uh, data if possible. If you're not familiar with hashing, you can get freeware software out there. Um, what this is going to do is an algorithm that's going to read the ones and zeros, the binary language that make that video what it is and provide you with this type of multi-character hexadecimal value. This acts as a fingerprint for each individual digital file that you're working with. This is incredibly important, especially when it comes to verification. Oftentimes these cases don't go to court right away. So if it ever comes into question, is the video that we're watching today the same video that was recovered from the system five years ago? You can verify that information and, and that data by using these file hashes. So I, I encourage you, if you're not familiar with file hashing, do a little research get some of the applications out there. We do uh, offer file hashing in Axon Investigate. Um, we will do that for you and it will uh, export that report for you that has all of that information. So um, back up your evidence data, you know, usually in triplicate is kind of the safe way. So um, just make sure it's on a hard drive, burn it to a disc, save it on a, you know, thumb drive, whatever you need to do to just make sure that you're, you know, protecting the integrity of that evidence and you're not at risk it, uh, at losing it at uh, any point. And of course, start that chain of custody. Now, um, I think where I'm going to kind of wrap up here is it was asked of me um, before the presentation today uh, about best practices on recovering video from the internet, whether it's YouTube or Facebook, social media, um, et cetera. I want to tell you that this is a very slippery slope. Um, especially from you know the individuals that are on this uh, this presentation, you you don't have the ability to get search warrants like police officers do, like investigators do. You know, court orders aren't something that just pop out of thin air. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of you know paperwork and due diligence that needs to go into that. But I will tell you that this kind of a Spider-Man concept of great power and great responsibility. Um, Collecting video off the internet without a lot of the stuff that you and I just talked about leaves you open and very vulnerable to a lot of complex questions that you most likely won't have the answer to. This is, uh, there isn't any way to validate that this software is, or, or the software, that this video is what it purports to be, right? Those are the two major things that we wanna do with digital video evidence. We wanna be able to verify it, like I just talked about hashing, and we need to be able to validate it to say, if I collected a video off YouTube, and to go into court and say this video was recorded by this individual with this phone, there is no way to verify or authenticate that video. You can submit paperwork and requests to the legal departments of these uh, of these sites and request that information, but you know, most of the time they're going to ask for a court order. They're going to ask for a search warrant. And if you don't have the ability to do that, you, you may not be able to get it. So again, I, I highly advise to be careful. Um, and mainly any type of opinions that you're drawing off that evidence. Um, I would say that most litigators and the triers of fact would look at video pulled off the internet as hearsay. Um, because there is no way to properly validate or verify that information. So again, that falls on the trier of fact, if they are going to present that evidence um, to make sure that they're presenting it properly and to be very careful of the type of opinions that are going to be presented in those cases based on that information. Because mainly the metadata, the data about data that's included in those video, those video files, as far as when it was recorded, what quality it was recorded at, the system or the device that recorded it, et cetera, 
all that gets lost once it's uploaded to the internet. So again, um, you you are at a great disadvantage for trying to pull that that data off, whether it's screen recordings or I mean, there used to be a service where you could plug in a YouTube URL and it would actually download that video from YouTube. I don't think it exists anymore, but again, I encourage you to uh, do a little work. But the reason I have uh, the scientific working group on digital video evidence on your screen is uh, again, the, the, the SWIG DE or the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence brings together organizations actively engaged in the field of digital and multimedia evidence to foster communication and cooperation as well as to ensure quality and consistency within the forensic community. So there are scientific working groups for digital video evidence, there are scientific working groups for latent prints, for ballistics and shell casings, et cetera. These are individuals that are actively in the field, writing paper, doing the research, uh, validating uh, these techniques. On their website, let me see if I can, um, if I can bring it up here real quick and bring it over here into my shared screen, um, getting in here, going into the documents, you can find their documents that are published. They have documents that are kind of step-by-step, -step, uh, uh, you know, explanations of, you know, best practices for Chromebook uh, acquisition and analysis, Linux technical. There's a lot of really technical stuff in here that um, you can learn from these, these scientific working groups. And these these documents, these these uh, procedures are the building blocks for most law enforcement and lab standard operating procedures. I can say that working uh, at the lab that I did, a lot of our SOP was based on the guidelines coming from the scientific working group of digital uh, evidence. Now, the reason I bring that up, um, if I uh, right here, Halfway uh, or just a little bit down the page, you will find a document that was published in January uh, of 2022 about the best practices of acquiring online content. I, I, I encourage you to read this, um, to look for it if this is the type of work that you're doing. Again, um, there's a lot of caveats that come with it, a lot of nuance, um, and a lot of casework uh, to look at, to understand you know, what type of video you're getting off the internet and how you're presenting that in court. Um, so again, I, I highly encourage you to look, uh, look through this website, Again, there's like just a wealth of information and most of the guidelines for anybody that does this type of work is based off the recommendation of these groups um, uh, on a number of different topics. So um, again, I encourage you to take a look at that and uh, hopefully that um, will steer you in the right direction and uh, keep us from getting into uh, any hot water in the courtroom or getting, you know, worst case scenario, getting our, getting our evidence thrown out because we did not do it. Uh, we did not do it properly. So um, there was a couple more topics that I wanted to touch base on, but I do know that we want to do some Q&A um, here at the end. So I think at this point, we will just leave it at that. And um, I am happy to uh, open up the floor for questions on some of the topics uh, that we just uh, we just talked about. Thank you, Casey, and thank you for that great presentation. Um, we do have a few questions in the queue. Um, the first one is, is it necessary uh, to hash videos from body-worn camera or other videos uploaded to evidence.com? Um, is it necessary to hash it? If you're, if you're uploading it to evidence.com, uh, evidence.com should be hashing anything that's already uploaded to your cases. So that should be, uh, that should already be done for you. So you shouldn't have to do that, um, you know, using, using a different application, um, that should already be done for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question that we have is that if you don't have an Axon community link, is there another way to provide someone with a link, such as Dropbox, so they can upload the video? Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's uh, Microsoft OneDrive and Dropbox. Those, those are definitely um, options and solutions uh, in those types of scenarios. I would... I would recommend using that file hashing process 
um, in order to verify that your files or your evidence or what have you, you know, what you're working with isn't changed through that process, right? Uh, much like I mentioned with emails, um, you 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 always want to be careful when you're when you're transferring data back and forth to make sure you're safeguarding it from from being changed or altered in any way. So um, if it's possible to hash it prior to the transfer, if not. Um, just make sure that you are hashing it as soon as you get it, saving that information, um, just in case if it ever comes into question that, well, how do we know that something didn't change during that uh, uh, that transfer process? But yes, those are fine. Um, you know, there's there's specific things that come into question as far as your CGIS, um, uh, you know, regulations and and what's being shared and who's got access to it so um just make sure that that it's something that it's you know kind of protected and locked down and not anybody can get in and get that you know um much like law enforcement and and investigators um we want to make sure that we're protecting that that audit trail and that paper trail of who's got what how you how you came into contact with this video um did anybody else touch it did anybody else have the ability to view it or see it you know we just want to make sure that we're protecting all of that uh, as well right thanks for that casey um we do have time for a few more i believe um so What's the best way to determine the actual date and time of a video when the date and time on the system is wrong? Um, that goes back to that documentation, as I had mentioned. So um, in my experience, if I am uh, standing in front of that system and I'm about to document or I'm about to collect evidence from that system, I document the exact date and time that's being displayed by that system in the live camera feed, right? So if it's, um, you know, tw uh, 1246 here in Denver on September 28th, and I'm standing in front of that system, and that's the date and time that it's showing, I annotate that. And then I refer to, um, I don't know where I put my cell phone, but I'll just look at this, the, the time on my cell phone. Um, there are applications that you can get that um, refer to uh, the, the, the server protocol time, the, the atomic clock, et cetera, that you can hold up right in front of that and say, okay, server time, you know, actual date and time right now is 1247, but the time being displayed on the screen right now is 147. So you want to document that. And then unfortunately, you got to do a little bit of math that can be a big headache, especially if you have really big offsets on systems. I think um, the biggest offset I had was it was a dry cleaners. I think their system was off by something like 30 years and four months, nine hours and 27. I mean, it was it was obnoxious. I'll tell you in Axon Investigate, we've put a calculator in there that will do all of that, that heavy lifting for you. So, you, you know, you're not going through reams of paper, especially when you get into military time and <laughs> it can be a headache. But that is the, the, the widely accepted by the forensic video community is to document the date and time that's being displayed at the time of extraction of that data and then what actual date and time is um, based on that server server time, server information, cell phone time, what have you. Something more reliable than just your watch, right? Because you might have, you know, your watch might, might not be correct. So um, just be weary of where that actual date and time is being recorded from. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks for that. Um, so the next question I have um, is, I believe this was in the latter part of your of your presentation, is the quote, slippery slope something that can be avoided when there is subpoena power involved? And if it does, what is the time frame we're looking at for the legal departments of third parties to respond when it's a, a video off of social media? That is a really good question. Um, I wish I could tell you the exact time frame as far as as uh, when a company, I guess, for lack of a better word, would respond. But it just depends on who you're dealing with, right? Because oftentimes you're dealing with Google, you're dealing with Facebook, you're dealing with Microsoft, right? Um, I know there was an investigation that I worked on that I had to request video from one of the, the cloud-based uh, services and their legal department would only communicate through email. They would not communicate over the phone because they need that paper trail. And of course they don't work on the weekends and they don't work after five o'clock. So you, you are always going to be at the mercy of their time. And, um, 
you know, it's it's I don't even know sometimes if the court orders or the search warrants will light a fire underneath them to get them moving either, right? Because again, you're dealing with these big convoluted corporations that that deal with that. So um, I wish I could provide a better answer to that. But through my experience, I've seen anywhere for um, as quick as a week to two weeks into three months, six months. Again, it just kind of depends on who, who you're dealing with, how much information you're asking for, and then what the, uh, you know, what the regulations are that their legal department has in place. Got it. Thank you. Um, so what is the best way to download video from YouTube or social other social media sites? Oof, that's that's another good question. Um, as I had mentioned, it, it's been a while. I'm a little out of practice. Um, man, I, and I and I couldn't I couldn't find. There used to be a website you could go to that gave you the ability to copy and paste a URL into their tool, and it would find that YouTube video and then download it download it off. Um, again, I, I don't know if it exists anymore. Give a look through that, that SWIG DE um, document. It may mention that. It may not. Um, that, that technology is changing. I wish I had more of a concrete explanation of how to get that off. But my training and my certification will tell you the best way is to write them directly and ask for it. Um, if, you can't, <laughs> if you can't get that, um, you may, you know, Google get on Google, ask the questions, how do I get video off of YouTube? And you may find something. But again, this this is uh, a lot of these companies, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, YouTube, Facebook, they're locking down their stuff. So you can't just go on and grab content off of their, um, off of their, uh, their, their sites um, as freely as you used to be able to maybe five to 10 years ago. So um, that's, Unfortunately, the best answer that I can provide, do a little research, see if you can find if there's any tools out there. But again, step one, see if you can go through the legal and proper ways of getting that video if possible. Great. Um, so I think we have a great question here to kind of round things out. Okay. So for someone new to using or obtaining digital evidence, what are the two or three most important things to know? Um, when collecting digital video evidence, mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a really good question. I appreciate that question. Um, number one, I would say, is that documentation. Document everything that you possibly can about that system. I went through that whole list. Um, if, uh, if anybody uh, wants to get that list, I'm happy to provide um, Cami and company you know, with, with maybe my, my, my slide presentation or what have you document as much as you possibly can. You as the person who is accountable for the origination of that, that evidence or that video or that data, the more you know about it, the better. Um, those technical aspects are what can end up in court and what if you don't know the answers to some of these, what can get your evidence thrown out or can get that, that data thrown out. Um, so that would be the first document, document, document everything that you possibly can. Cause I, you know, the lab should be, your technician should be, police officers, investigators, everybody should be documenting that information. Um, the second I would, I would suggest um, is back to that proprietary, uh, the proprietary formats. Um, you want to be careful that you're getting that video in the most uh, or in the best possible quality you can. So if you're, and and again, this is this is a, a a big topic put into a really small box to to answer this question. But um, if you're taking the proprietary format or version of that video and you're telling the system, I want you to give it to me in an MP4 or into an AVI, the compression used to shrink that file down to change that file into an MP4 into an AVI you don't know what it's doing. So you could actually be, you know, losing data, losing information by doing that compression, by, by asking for something other than the native. So again, um, 
do a little research, uh, again, get some, get some training, get some certification if possible, if you have the ability to do that, to understand proprietary video. Um, so that that's definitely number two, is uh, making sure that you're just getting that video in the best possible form that you can. Um, and then from an acquisition standpoint, uh, I'd say the last one is just make sure that you're protecting the, the integrity of your evidence. You're backing it up, you're hashing it, um, you know, you're, 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 you're protecting it in a manner that, again, with all the information that you documented at the time of extraction, you know that the video is in its best form and you know that you've protected it since the time you acquired it. Um, it doesn't leave a whole lot of uh, loopholes, so to speak, to, you know, for your work to be, uh, you know, discredited. Great. Thank you for that, um, Casey. And I think we'll need to end it there today, unfortunately. But I just want to extend my appreciation to you for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Um, I'm sure you know, NACOL could not do what it does without you and others so willing to share your knowledge with the oversight community as a whole. So thank you. I, I really appreciate the uh, the invitation to be here. If by chance you ever come across me at a booth at a conference, please come up, introduce yourself. Um, I'm always happy to uh, you know actually meet people in person rather than from you know here in my home office. So if you <laughs> if you see me out at a conference, introduce yourself. You know maybe we can set this up and I can expand further on some of these topics. But it was a real pleasure being here today. Wonderful. And I also would like to thank Jason Wechter, Chair of the Training, Education, and Standards Committee, and Tina Barr, NACOL's new Director of Training and Education, for all of their work to make today's event a reality. Of course, I must also thank all of you in attendance for taking the time to join us today. As I mentioned before, there are still two more events in the 2023 NACOL webinar series that are open for registration now, and because you've joined us today, you can simply add them to your existing registration. More information about these events can be found on the NACOL website. Also, remember to register for NACOL's 29th Annual Conference, which will take place November 12th through the 16th in Chicago, Illinois. If you've not already re registered, I suggest you do so soon. Um, there have also been two virtual conferences added to the NACOL training schedule for December. Please watch your inboxes for additional information on the events and how to register. And with that, thank you for being with us today, and we look forward to being with you next time. Thank you, everyone.